All right, we try to do a interview with Miles Cotter Sparrow, but it didn't work. So we're trying again now. Miles, That's better. <laughs> are you in? Yeah, I'm in. I can actually see myself now. Last time we were talking, and everything, but I couldn't see any of the live feed stuff. All right, well, cool. So hopefully this is working now. Anyway, um, this is Miles Cotter Sparrow of Rollblade USA. Hey, on. We had started a conversation that didn't work. So a little background. Miles and I both live in Vermont, uh, which is a small state in the USA. Miles works for Rollblade, which is based out of New Hampshire, which is about, an, what, 45 minutes from your house? Yeah. I think it's like a 40-mile 40, 40 drive, 30, one way, 35, something, something like that. So, uh, Miles, you started skating because of skiing. Yeah. So how did you get lead into skating from skiing? So I I got my first pair of skates, like I was saying before, um, from like Ames, uh, like some ultra wheels. And then just fooling around the driveway and what have you. And then one of my friends, uh, his dad's a ski coach, and he started doing dry land training with us on skates. Um, so that's kind of how I got into it. And then me and my buddy, his his son, Dylan, we just skate around town. I grew up in Rutland, Vermont. So it's a, it, at the time it was the second largest city in the state. Now I think it's the third. So it's got a downtown and suburbs and lots of places to skate. So we used to just like cruise the streets and find things to roll on basically. <laughs> and then that kind of started to spawn aggressive skating because that was happening. And actually there was a half pipe at a Taco Bell in town um, that, a, that an older guy, Josh Mack, uh, was part of it and so that I started skating that we'd skate across town to the taco bell and like buy a drink and then we'd get refills all day and we just like hang out and skate the mini ramp <laughs> that's funny so so you guys ended up opening your own skate park called zero gravity yes and then what was involved with that park so because of the dry land training for skiing we my dad was a was a builder and a contractor so he had a lot of building skills and we got a hold of uh, one of those Thrasher magazine books that they put out for building ramps. Right. So he learned how to like attach coping and, and he was a really good builder. He used to build furniture and stuff. So, and cool. we started building some ramps to, to use for our dry land training, you know, to work on different balance stuff, you know, if coming. So we built like some drop in ramps and some humps and, and then just slowly started building more ramps for the camps. And then before we knew it, we had basically like a small skate park that we were using in a town-owned building. So we worked with the rec department to open the skate park. It was like privately run, but um, we did benefits, benefits for the city, um, like discount if you're a resident or if we did vouchers if you couldn't afford a pass and stuff like that. So it was a really cool relationship having like a private venture of a skate park uh, with, a, with a municipality. So you were doing ski racing growing up, and was that what you, you, you were doing for dryland training for blading? Was for ski racing, or? Yeah, we'd set up cones, or we'd have gates. So, like, at that time in inline skating and in the early, really early 90s, like, there were still World Cup athletes that used skates. Mm -hmm. they, do, they do again now, but they use them for dryland, so we were mimicking that. They had breakaway gates which is if you know anything about skiing like you hit the gate and it falls down and you ski around it so you we'd mount those to a, a base plate and then put weight on it so we'd set up like gate courses and just practice technique you know, and then the your skate park and what year was that the skate park opened to uh 1992 um okay. and then and then by 94 it was it was had a lot more ramps in it. Like I was saying, like for camps, we just started building more and more stuff to work on, you know, balance and coordination. So you were in high school back then? Yeah. yeah. Well, and, uh, yeah. and then you got into aggressive skating. And how did your aggressive skating mesh with your skiing? Uh, I just started looking at the snow like I did uh, look at, you know, the, the streets like on skate. I had like that skate brain. So... I just started working on skiing backwards. My, uh, like before even ski blade, like snow blades or whatever, 
um, the small short skis. We used to like find old skis and cut them in half and like create an angle so you could go backwards and make like short skis to like practice skate moves. And um, yeah, so it like really influenced my like playfulness that comes from skating on snow. Cool. Um, so at the at the zero gravity skate park, what big events were you, did you guys have for inline skating? I remember you did ASA qualifiers. Event. Yep. So we had a lot of pros come in for that. We did. We would have our own series. So we'd do like all throughout the summer, we had like our sky high series and it would be like skateboard, bike and inline. And we would do like three or four and then a final. And that was just like, you know, the New England area people would travel up for it. We were the biggest park in New England at the time. It was 25,000 square feet. So bigger than Rye before Rye Airfield, if you know that place. And, uh, and then, and then we, because of us hosting those events, we connected with the ASA group and then we started hosting ASA qualifiers. And then we ended up hosting the ASA regional qualifiers to go to world. So people would travel. I'm losing you, Miles. Oh, can you, you hear me? There? I'm here. Yeah, I can hear you again. Okay. Where'd I cut off? Uh, we're talking about the ASA qualifiers. So yeah, we started hosting the qualifiers and and then they were regional qualifiers and then they became the national or the world qualifiers um, to go to world qualifiers. So people were driving from all over the East coast to come do it. And we used to video the whole event and I, and I was looking around in the, the other day and I think I found one of the CDs and we would film the whole event and then we'd create a CD, uh, a, a DVD, of the event so everybody would get a clip in it and then we'd mail it out to all the participants that would come to the ASA qualifier. So I want to try to find that. I want to share with you, Jan. I think you'd get a kick out of it. But oh, that's cool. I mean, there was people that, I mean, just, I'm trying to think of some of the different pros. I mean, that's where I first met Ariel from New York. He, okay. He came up to one of those. Um, and then uh, Kaya from Montreal, mm -hmm. she came down. That's where she, moved through and went to the final the worlds and qualified and became pro um yeah Different. and um so how long did the park last till what year did it close down so we were there until 2005 and then we joined forces with a, a friend and uh, opened a small ski resort in new hampshire or reopened it had been closed for a while and moved our skate park there so technically the rutland facility was till 2005 mm -hmm. we were at whale back in new hampshire from 2005 um to i mean it's still open and running it's a non-profit now but the zero gravity portion of it ended in uh, 2017 i believe okay so and we did um with well back, you were still doing the zero gravity camps and ramp building across yep. England. Yes, we were. Park. Yeah. What was, what it was the camps about? So we'd run like a a whole spectrum of camps. So we'd have like a learn to camp. So it'd be ki kids that were, I mean, we'd have four year olds up to like 12 at the max. And that was just like learning how to skate and introducing them to um, the basics of skating and then aspects of skating like hockey or speed um, and skate to ski. And then we'd do like a, a, a park day on the last day. And then we'd have full on um, uh, just like inline skate week long sessions where you just work on aggressive skating, uh, skateboarding too. We, we ran overnight camps. Um, so back in the early two thousands, I mean, we would have, we had a really good website, so like Woodward would fill up all the time, and we'd get a lot of overflow from that. Okay, which was pretty cool. I mean, kids from against Woodward back then. Yeah, we lost, but <laughs> Woodward's quite an animal. Where was the actual skating uh, skate park at? It was not well back Mountain, was it? So camps. That's true. So like the camps evolved to to Whale back, uh, along with the overnight camps, and we had built and manufactured skate parks for all kinds of communities over the years. And one of them was in the nearby town where Whaleback was located. So we started managing their Yeah, you started managing the yeah. skate park. 
so we started we ran the skate park for the town like the rec director let us uh run it because then they didn't have to worry about it and then we just paid them uh a, a rent a rent fee basically and that and that was in white river junction so it was a park we had previous built previously built and then we just added to it we put our foam pit in and we put our uh our gymnastic flybed trampoline and so we had more of a training facility than just just the ramps and at the same time you're doing that with well back in the camps you were also working for rosie's usa in west lebanon yeah i started with rosie's uh 2008 i believe so i had a long we had a long time relationship with the general manager uh of rosie's just through the skate park and selling skates and i mean we used to be a senate dealer and stuff like that so mm. and then when I, when we moved over to Whaleback, it was close to where Rosie's facility was. So this is kind of natural for me to start helping him out there. And then it just, it, I just transitioned from Whaleback to Rosie's full time. And what were you doing at Rosie's? Um, I was doing a lot of things. I mean, it was a small operation. So was, we wore a lot of hats, but um, I was the assistant general manager by the, by the end. And so I was doing everything from uh, setting up accounts um, to, um, place to doing the booking orders for the for the u.s like what what skates would come in um sending out skates because we, we did volo too so i uh, would talk with john quite a bit um on, on different projects um what skates were bringing in and who to send what what athletes needed them and so a, a lot of i mean i wore all the hats i mean you name it <laughs> it was a you small there for several years right yeah i was there until 2000 uh to the end of 2016. And what year did you start? Uh, 2008. Okay. And then you transitioned to Rollerblade. And it's funny because when I moved to Vermont, I didn't realize Rollerblade USA was in an hour down the street from me. And it happens to be across from Rossi's USA. So you basically got the job across the street from Rossi's USA at Rollerblade USA. And how did that happen? Uh, well, my friend Tom Heiser um, moved up to um, Vermont, New Hampshire, because it's a small little two states there to work at Rollerblade. And then um, he would come to the skate park and we became closer. And a time came where he they needed to hire someone and they, uh, they interviewed me and they hired me. So I stopped taking a right hand turn mm -hmm. to go to OCs and I started taking a left hand turn to go to rollerblade so and and i never like mixed that up i never drove into the wrong parking lot i always thought that's, that's good that's I good <laughs> i mean the rollerblade basically rossi's usa is very small compared to rollerblade usa you know you guys have the big a much bigger warehouse at rollerblade a huge office rollerblade's part of technica group so it's not just rollerblade it's nordica technica blizzard anything mm -hmm. else uh, we started doing footwear again, um, and that, yeah, but that's it. Yeah, those brands. So, what do you do for Rollerblade? Now? What's your job title or job duties for Rollerblade USA? Uh, product marketing coordinator. I uh, I help Tom uh, with marketing and promotional things. I, I do a lot with the Rollerblade van, going to different events, uh, promoting existing events. The other thing that I worked on was creating our skate to ski program. So one of my main hats is uh, helping communicate the skate to ski program and training system to Alpine skiers, the different communities out there, all the, the PSIA, the professional skier, ski instructors of America, or the uh, competitive Alpine racing group, which is United States ski and snowboard. Those are the people that Olympians that you see, that are skiing all come up through that system. Um, so that, that's been a lot of what I've done over the last couple of years is, is helping put that program in place and then communicating it. So that program is basically a throwback to, you know, how Rollerblade started when Rollerblade was actually kind of designed to be off season training for skiing. Is that correct? Well, Roll I mean, technically, skiing. technically Olsen created, in the rollerblade brand for uh, hockey okay uh, and then it quickly became as as we all know today i mean it's just it's it's a lot of fun and it, it applies to anybody looking for fitness and and then the similarities of just ice skating to skiing are quite similar and then once you can take 
something that's similar like ice skating, but put it on wheels and, and allow yourself to go anywhere and use gravity with hills. It was like almost uh, a no brainer for the US ski team at that time in the eighties to be putting their, their skiers on skates. And then, and then youth people started using it. And that's how like my friend's dad um, found skating was because he was an Alpine ski coach working with kids. And he's like, Oh, uh, inline skating is great for, um, for skiing and let's start hosting camps. So everything from like the upper level skier right down through, um, you know, some younger kid in 10 or 14 or whatever was using skates in, in the, in the eighties and into the nineties for, for ski training. And then now we've flashed forward. I mean, skis have changed, technology's changed. So some of this, so we've redeveloped the system to match today's need for skiers. So it's built off of the skills quest, which is um, a series of different skills that skiers can practice on snow to like hone in their, their skills. And then we adapted that for asphalt with skates. So then people can practice those things that they do on snow on asphalt with, with inline skates. Um, and it's a pretty low cost really. And you can do it anywhere. You don't need a hill. You could just use a parking lot. So it's really accessible. Um, Have you noticed an increase in skiers doing off training on blades now more than the past? Absolutely. I think, I think everything has a resurgence and I think because of all the work we've been doing and, and, and promoting skating again to skiers, they've fallen in love with it again. And part of what I've been doing is going out on the road and, and hosting, helping to host skate to ski events and putting skiers on skates again. Are you and, skiers on three by three skates or uh, four, four wheel skates? Both, both. But, um, I think if someone's starting off, I mean, a three wheel is pretty high off the ground. So you really like a, like a four by 90 or a four by 80 is a really good way to start for a skier. And they can progress to a, to a bigger wheel. And especially with the interchangeable frames. That's what I tell people, you know, you invest in like a Mac, a Maxim 90 four by, and then you have that frame forever, which is a really fun frame. I love my four by nineties. And then you can upgrade and, and buy a different three by setup and, you got something for cruising and something for more maneuverability. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I tell people. And it's, it works out well. A lot of people want to just get right into the three wheel because it looks rad. But if you're not comfortable skating yet and you're trying to balance on the, the narrow points at the top of a wheel on a tall wheel, a lot of people will roll in and they have to really learn how to stand on those outer edges, and um, which they do. I mean, they've got the skills from skiing. It's just, I feel like the smaller wheels are a better way to have fun with it from the get-go rather than trying to like fight that, that right. gravity. That makes sense. Um, so you also, you know, drive, you said you drove around with the robot van around the country and you've also been going to a lot of the social skates, um, like in Miami and Boston and different places. Um, what's that scene like in the U S with the social skates? Uh, it's great. I mean, each, major city has a really good community of um with meetups i mean it's fun to visit the city and, and skate through the different cities and, and get the vibe of that energy um and i'd say like you know denver's got a really good community dust um and philly uh the philly scene in new york and dc miami um la obviously um chicago um, but there's, so what's, there's your favorite, other, what's your favorite city to skate in? Oh, geez. I really, you know, I like have fun whenever I'm on skates, but there's something about Philly that was really fun. Um, doing, we did like this, uh, inline skate splunking. And if you don't know what splunking is, it's when you go caving, like you go into a cave with headlamps or whatever. So they call it splunking because no one's in the subway on Sundays. So you can skate um put 15 blocks underground so that was really rad there's like literally nobody in there but 150 skaters just cruising the subway for 15 blocks underground that was pretty fun plus the history of philly is really cool too just you know early america and seeing those buildings and skating around them was pretty rad um yeah it sounds LA, awesome. I've la's fun too really yeah just uh the suburbs for aggressive skating yeah, it's, it's, it's cool. They always meet um, at the, uh, 
rocky steps there at the art museum and okay. then from there you can get anywhere there's like bike lanes that just that, that start basically right there there's a skate park just down over the corner from where the steps are which is pretty fun it's kind of like a has like a urban like plaza feel to it but it does have transitions too so it's kind of got a little bit of everything um so moving on to rollerblade itself rollerblade was founded in the usa and it's gone through several changes of owners throughout the years um now it's headquartered in italy and then you guys kind of run the usa side of things here in new hampshire um north american technically but. north american so what's the what's the um What's the, the who's what, like the with decision making and everything with new skates and team? Um, who does that fall to? Like the uh, US skate guys or the Italy guys? Well, there's skaters, there's skaters all around the globe, right? So you mm -hmm. can't just have so we we work with the European counterpart to um develop the team, um, post and share content. Um, it's it's a collaborative thing between across the pond so to speak um so we are based out of italy and it's been there for a while so even before the, the current group that owns rollerblade it was still in a, a family-owned business in italy too so it's still owned by a um you know a private family in, okay. in italy which is cool and have you got to go to italy yet to roll by <laughs> no not yet not yet well hopefully they send you there well, we got to get past this COVID thing before anybody's going anywhere. And is uh, the skate the ski program you've been working on here? Are they doing that in Europe at all, or is that just strictly with Rollerblade North America? No, it's so we we piloted it here and we we built the system in the U.S., but it, it's meant to go across the globe. Um, the thing about the U.S. is, you know, we're a bunch of states, so we have like one governing body for all the skiers across the US, but in, in Europe, you, you've got different governing bodies for each country. So it's, it'd be a little bit more complicated to just start in Italy, for instance, where we have like a big draw to skating in the US, might as well build it in the US in English and then, um, and then branch it out to the, the different ski countries out there. And okay. that's, that's what we've been doing. So it's, it's yeah, live. I, it's, the concept of that's really good, I think, you know, because I started skiing what, two seasons ago, and to me, it's just like inline skating down a mountain. Um, <laughs> it is. <laughs> so, you know, and living in Vermont, you don't have a lot of, you can't ski, I mean, skate most of the year because it's all snow. So definitely skiing makes up for it. Um, back with, you know, Rollblade, the past few years, I feel like you guys have focused more on urban skating and entry-level skating and kind of gone away from the aggressive side of things a little bit but recently you've added more aggressive riders like philip moore caleb smith who's also does distance skating and i hear that you guys are working on a skate project again mm -hmm. just that you yeah. yeah we've been leaking photos of the new soul plate um which is on our instagram and other places so if you're if you've been tapped into the aggressive uh, community you've, you've seen stuff already um, some of our riders already skating it if you were at winter clash you would have seen people on it um, but we're definitely you know we've always supported the aggressive community that's never really stopped we've always had an aggressive team over the last um, 10 years or 15 years whatever um, since the heyday you know late late 2000s um, so we've always supported um, you know, Cameron, uh, uh, Coco was on the team for a while, um, Sean, and then now, you know, we're adding some more people because we're, we're, we're reinvesting um, new tech and new designs into a, into a skate. So that's something Tom's been working on, um, mm -hmm. and uh, he's going to be talking more about that. Before yeah, we're going to have a feature with Tom on his website, bigwheelblading.com, about that new rollerblade aggressive skate. Uh, in the near future. Um, there was, uh, for the aggressive skaters out there, me and Mom host every summer a rampant camp in New England. It's four days and three nights of skating, skate parks and camping in Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, it's New England Bladen Camp 
on Instagram if you guys want to check it out. And uh, not sure what the status of it is this year with the whole COVID-19 situation. Yeah. So I haven't set a date yet, but um, I'd like to have it this year. It might get delayed or it might get canceled, but we'll see. We'll keep it posted. But that's a fun trip. We usually have about 100 skaters from around New England and Canada show up for it. Yeah, it's cool. Um, I mean, we are really rural up here, Jan, you know, like, as long as we're not bringing the sickness with us and we're being safe, you know, who, you know, who knows if we can, it'd be kind of neat if, if New York gets better and those, those skaters down there can break free and spend some time in the hills, you know, and skate in the parks and cook some food at the campfire. And I mean, it's been a lot of fun. And like, right, you, yeah. you should check out the article on your, on the big wheel site because it's got a lot of great photos and some cool content. Yeah, actually, the, the story from last year, I haven't even posted yet, but that'll be coming up soon. Um, how With the COVID-19 situation affecting so many businesses, I assume rollerblades not considered essential. So you're apparently, you're at home right now. So you, were you guys sent, confined to home from work or did you guys shut down completely? So, I mean, we're based out of Italy. So, you know, the Italian office, um, was feeling it first. And then our CEO here in the U S had the foresight to send us home at the beginning of uh, March. And then the warehouse just reopened a couple weeks ago. So stores are getting shipped product again. And um, so that part of the business is essential. Um, but myself being at my desk in the office is, is not an essential thing I can do. What I need to do from home. So it's, it's great. We've been quarantining and, following those protocols going out to the grocery store as little as possible. Um, Have you guys noticed an increase in sales now that more people are at home and bored and wanting to skate? I mean, I've heard from friends, people are seeing more people on this out skating. I've, I've been getting contacted by tons of people. I mean, the energy is the, the sport is, is booming right now um, because people can't drive their hour or two to their mountain bike place or whatever their activity was, even skiing too. I mean, the skiing season was shut, shut down early. I mean, we had another two months of good skiing left and all these competitive skiers, all their end of the season events were canceled. So there's like a lot of people that like just skiers alone, they're like, what are they going to do? Like the next best thrill is skating really. I mean, that's going to give you all the same vibes as being on snow. Um, so th I think a lot of people have been thinking, well, what can I do without, risking myself and my family and like they pull their skates out or they go online and they buy skates again and right falling back in love with the sport because you and i all know that skating's just it's fun and if you haven't done it a while and you put them back on like you always wonder why you stopped to begin with <laughs> I, I mean i there was a short period i didn't skate in san diego when i moved back to austin texas i you know fell in love with it again skated pretty much every day for five years now in Vermont, it's much harder to skate because I'm so rural. Um, have you been skating a lot now with the coronavirus situation? Are you? Well, I've been getting out to, I have a rural road. It's by a farm um, and there's like nobody there. So I've been skating that when I can. But honestly, it's been kind of snowing on and off and raining. So the weather hasn't been like great for me to try to get out every day. But I, I'm getting out maybe once a week. So. Okay, well, yeah, that's better than me. I've only gotten out. <laughs> what, twice so far this year because of the snow? I mean, it's still snowing. We still have snow at our house. Yeah, it's melted mainly around here. It's There's a few little zones that have it, but, and the dusting, we, the snow that we got recently, the one that you got a lot of, that all melted because we got so much rain the other day, it was pouring and pouring, so everything just washed away again. Yeah, I woke up this morning and there was probably about two inches of snow. Now it's all melted again. <laughs> and now it's snowing again. So, yeah. So, um, anyway, it was good chatting with you, Miles. Um, I hope you're doing well. And this is the first of our Blading Talk discussions with different skaters and people in the industry. Um, we are also raising money on our GoFundMe right now for the website renewal for our domain and everything. You can get more information at bigwheelblading.com. Or if you want to support us, you can Venmo at Big Wheel Blading. Um Anyway, Miles, thanks for joining us today. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Jan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. Take care. Cheers, brother. Bye.